Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Provocative Conversations. Hi, Dr. Alicia. Hi, Dr. Renee. How are you today? I'm pretty good. I wanted to first and foremost apologize to our um, listeners for we were unable to have it last week because your provocateurs, Dr. Alicia and myself, are so busy focusing on provoking the world, provoking action and provoking change that we do have a, a very intense schedule with so much going on right now with the war, Dr. Alicia's political campaign and other crises and things that we're solving. So please know that it is in no way a reflection of us having any decrease or lack of desire and promotion um, of hardiness and being with you guys. It's just simply a matter of doing what we do for our part of helping to save the world and making it better. And sometimes that just means we just get called away. But as much as possible, we are trying to limit those situations. Like today, Dr. Alicia is on travel. I'm in the middle of another you know, crisis situation. But nothing is too important to stop that we can't at least have at least a one hour break to come talk to you guys. So thank you for listening. Thank you for your loyalty. And we promise to continue providing you with provocative conversations. And today, speaking of provoking thought and provoking action, what are we talking about, Dr. Alicia? Well, I'm sure listeners have been uh, following the news. And so we Dr. Renee and I had talked about uh, speaking to abortion a while back, mm-hmm. and it mm-hmm. was on our list of topics to explore. Uh, both of us um, are interested in talking about this. We we might have varying opinions on this matter, mm-hmm. uh, but we thought it was something that could be a, a good topic. So lo and behold, we've had quite quite an eventful week in terms of Roe yes. v. Wade here. Yes. Um, and so we thought we would focus on that today. And I will go through some background on uh, not only how Roe v. Wade came into being, but also some of the uh, different legislation that's been happening across the country. And then we're just going to talk about it uh, mm-hmm. just between just between two friends and mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. our ideas and opinions. And, you know, hopefully we can even talk to um, perhaps what this could mean going forward if it's overturned, or I should say when it's overturned. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's maybe where we can talk about the uh, provoking actions that people can take. Mm -hmm. And I do want to let listeners know that we do have different opinions and different ideas and thoughts. So this is not a canned or trying to, you know, program your minds for anything. This is an open conversation that we hope that you too can share and have with your colleagues who may have different opinions as well. So let's get started, Dr. Alicia. Sounds good. All right. So I was thinking it would be a good idea just to start with a little bit of background. We're not going to get into it too deeply, but just, Mm -hmm. you know, what is Roe v. Wade? When did it become a thing and why? So uh, it's a legal case that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on in January of 1973, so many years ago. Uh, And it was ruled actually seven to two, so majority in favor, that unduly restrictive state regulation of abortion is unconstitutional. So why is that unconstitutional? You may wonder. That's a good question. The court held, so the reason why I even came to the court is because there was a a Texas statute criminalizing abortion in most instances. So that was uh, brought to the Supreme Court and the court held that those um, statutes violated a woman's constitutional right of privacy, which is found to be implicit in the liberty guarantee of the due process clause of the 14th amendment, which says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. So there have been challenges to Roe v. Wade since 1973, uh, but for the most part, it has not been overturned. There was a a case, uh, Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey in 1992, and the Supreme Court established that Uh, restrictions on abortion are unconstitutional if they place an undue burden on a woman seeking an abortion before a fetus is viable. So there are a lot of different, um, you know, this, this, uh, legis this, I'm sorry, the Supreme court ruling has been challenged since its inception. So Mm -hmm. it's been under 
um, attacks from especially mm -hmm. more conservative leaning states since the beginning of its, uh, you know, ruling in 1973. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit of the history. And there, are, you know, going into the case of Roe v. Wade, the actual case is pretty interesting. Uh, I would recommend people like go out and read about it, but you know, we're not going to get too much in the weeds there with that. Um, but I definitely encourage people to go and read like, why did this even come to being? Um, right. But and that we can is include the basic. some of the basic links on the website. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, that information I got was actually from Britannica. So <laughs> the encyclopedia, because <laughs> it is a historical mm -hmm. ruling, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so today, what we're seeing is that there are states across our country enacting laws. And this has been going on for a long time. Like, I swear, every couple of years here in Florida, we are fighting different legislation. So there are states that are enacting laws uh, that restrict a woman's access to abortion. And to be clear, Roe v. Wade um, is protecting abortion up to 24 weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of what you see in terms of legislation is uh, making it harder at certain times during a pregnancy to access abortion. So for example, in Florida, uh, HB5 is a bill that was passed just this past legislative session. And it is a 15 week abortion ban. So prohibiting abortions after 15 weeks, even in cases of rape, incest, or human trafficking. Now, I do wanna mention that's despite the polling that shows that 60% of Floridians don't believe that a woman's access should be denied. So mm -hmm. if you think about this, cause I'm gonna go through this a couple of times. Okay. The majority of people in the state disagree with that. But anyway, um, other states have passed sweeping laws that also further deteriorate a woman's right to privacy and access mm -hmm. to abortion. So in Texas, there's new legislation that would make performing pretty much most abortions a felony. Uh, uh, now in Texas, 70, and this is a recent poll that just was conducted in April before the leak of the Supreme Court opinion. But in Texas, 74% of Texans believe that abortion should be allowed in some format, 74%. That's an mm -hmm. overwhelming majority. Right. And despite this, uh, this um, legislation was passed, but I think I wanted, I wanted to call it Texas. I mean, Florida I had to, because you know, Florida, mm -hmm. but <laughs> of course go hard. Florida. Despite, right. Despite the 74% of Texans who believe that this right should be protected, at least in some form, you know, so there's a lot of different ideas and I think that's what you and I are probably going to talk about. Um, the worst part is how it was enacted because um, and this was actually back in September is when it was enacted. Uh, it, it, ba it bans abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. So I want to talk to that in a minute. But then also the way it was written to be able to um, get around protections on abortion access is they are relying on private lawsuits for enforcement. Mm. So this is, I mean, I just cannot believe this. So basically is creating yeah. what critics are calling bounty hunters because it allows anyone right, yeah. to file a lawsuit and seek damages of at least $10,000, even if they don't even know a person who oh, is wow. seeking an abortion. So they don't even have to have a direct personal contact. Mm -hmm. And I think I read it was also against the provider. Yeah, uh, I, I think I've read that too. I don't have that in front of me, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically... Um, that's one of the, I think, one of the more mm -hmm. draconian and drastic mm -hmm. laws. So I want to go back yeah. to this idea of six weeks of pregnancy, because um, if anybody knows anything about the way a woman's body works, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's often impossible to know that you're pregnant at six weeks. That's right. the thing that is um, not impossible, but it's, it's right. a lot of people don't even know that they're pregnant until they're eight weeks or 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because a woman's period is not always 20. I mean, there's this myth that a woman's cycle is 28 days. That's actually really incorrect. My yeah. cycle, for example, was, uh, I think mine was like 21 days, you know? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Some people's are like even less than that. Some people's are 60 day cycles. So you could have a, you could be a person. And I think there's a term, a, guy, a, a medical term for having a really long cycle, but mm -hmm. you could be a person who has a 45 day cycle, not realize you're pregnant, and you know your window of opportunity in terms of texas's law is gone right right that's true 
That's um, true. Now so I that, was, I was very sad. I knew that, well, I didn't know I was pregnant, but I knew something was wrong because I couldn't figure out why my stomach was getting fat. And I think <laughs> around maybe like, and I kept doing more and more exercises and I couldn't figure out why I was so tired <laughs> and why I couldn't do my exercises like I should. But then I um, also, I think maybe like around eight weeks though, I did start feeling something funny. And I mean, of course, by then I was, you know, confirmed as having, you know, being pregnant, but by eight weeks, I could feel, you know, my, you know, my son in my stomach. I felt like little flutterings. I didn't know what it was. They kept saying, oh, no, 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 you can't feel it that soon. You can't feel it that soon. But you, like you said, every woman's body is different. And even when I was ovulating, I could always tell not only when I was ovulating, but when I was about to ovulate. So, you know, every woman's body is different, but like I could feel, you know, not only myself when I was about to ovulate, but I could feel when I was ovulating. But when I've worked with women who have had abortions, then sometimes what's important for others to understand is that people can often confuse just having blood as a period when it's actually breakthrough bleeding. And so that's another mm-hmm. way people may not think that they're pregnant because they're having bleeding, which is common when you are first pregnant. And then you're like, oh, no, I was pregnant. I didn't even know. Yeah. I mean, there's a bazillion. That's the funny thing is yeah. I feel like this is a reflection of a lack of understanding of women's health, which I've that's always right. had an issue with. That's right. Because I feel like um, a lot of times the medical community And now, you know, these state legislators, especially in some of these states, are mostly men, don't really understand how nuanced a woman's body is. Like, we have so much stuff that goes on in our bodies. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yes. And the fact that, like, you know non-medical people are making these decisions on behalf Mm -hmm. of women is what really, really, really bothers me about this. Um, Yeah. But to sum up the, because I'm, I'm just about done, I, I, I just okay. wanted to mention that there are um, 13 states um, that have trigger laws that will immediately go into effect um, if the Roe ruling is overturned. So like Florida, like Texas, like all of these um, laws are being challenged. And usually, so what's happened in Florida um, and what I was mentioning before is that, you know, there are these laws that come into effect, but they're challenged. They go to the different levels of court and they're overturned because of Roe v. Wade. So Roe v. Wade has acted as a sort of protection, if you will, to state legislated uh, abortion laws. So we are now at a time where the, now this is just our current state. So I just wanted to make, make a few comments about what's happening. So first of all, what's happened this past week is that there was a leak draft opinion. So this was not an official opinion. So this, Mm -hmm. this was not an official thing. So abortion is legal. Uh, you know, it, it, depending on where you're at and whatever state you're in. So, you you know, you have to check state laws, but abortion is still legal. Those battles with those states are still happening because Roe v. Wade is still in effect. Uh, now, of course, there are, you know, we're, I, I feel like the odds are pretty much stacked against that ruling to stay in effect because there has been a long, decades long effort to get to where we are right now. Mm-hmm. So um, it's been a, you know, like I said, a long term coordinated effort to just ban out abortion outright. So um, that's what's happening right now. Um, And what I just want to reiterate is that poll after poll, year after year, the voters are supportive in general of Roe v. Wade. Like I said, there may be differences in opinion of when an abortion should occur, how abortion should occur, uh, for what reason should an abortion occur. But in general, I think uh, the the statistic is 69% of Americans just generally Mm -hmm. want Roe v. Wade to remain the law of the land. And like mm-hmm. I said, here in Florida, it's 60% of Floridians. Uh, in Texas, 74%. So what we're seeing is an overwhelming support of this constitutional right. Um, and yet here we are because, again, this long-term coordinated effort uh, to ban abortion has been happening. So, um, yeah, 
you want to jump in with our just our personal mm -hmm. ideas and so mm -hmm. forth? Yeah, I think I start? think yeah. Well, I mean, I guess we could talk about um I guess maybe just what what is your opinion? Are you for or against it? And then I guess we could go from there and maybe talking about our opinions and then maybe the psychology of it, or I could start off with the psychology sure. of it. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm definitely a pro-choice woman. I've been, mm -hmm. um, you know, advocating for a woman's right to choose since I could remember. Um, yes, I, yeah. <laughs> I think that, um, what I believe, there's, this is what I believe. First of all, I do believe it's a violation of privacy because what mm -hmm. I fundamentally believe is what happens to my body should be between me, a medical provider, and whomever else I choose to include in that decision. Mm -hmm. uh, family planning is often put on a woman's shoulders, is often the burden of a woman to, to, to decide how it goes forward. Um, and it's not an easy it's not easy, right? Like mm -hmm, there are mm -hmm. a bazillion reasons why a woman may or may not be able to have a child, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are so many variables that happen in somebody's life that makes it not a cut and dry situation. Mm -hmm. But the point that I feel is that because every pregnancy mm -hmm. and every situation is different and we can't know all the factors that are involved in someone's personal decision, the decision of if and when to start a family is deeply personal. And I don't believe mm -hmm. that politicians have any place in that decision. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's why, that's why to me, it's a fundamental issue of privacy, which is why I agree with the original ruling of Roe v. Wade, which is to protect a woman's right to privacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can see that. Well, my opinion is, I do not agree with having abortions um, as a form of sexual, um, pro, you know, protection um, or, you know, but I do believe that the woman should have her choice in doing it. I don't think that anyone should take that choice away from the woman. And I do think it's also important to know that you know, we're focusing, as you said, on women, you know, the women, um, their bodies are the ones that are being controlled. But um, it's also interesting that, well, why not just have everyone, everyone have vasectomies, you know, all guys have vasectomies. And then maybe like, if, if you're going to control one gender's body, then why not also control, you know, the male's body as well. So I feel as if since you know, since they're not going to do that because it's mostly men making the decisions, that's because you're recognizing that it's, it is biased and it is unfair. So I don't, you know, again, I feel like there's a deeper social and moral issue with um, why people would use um, abortion as a form of birth control compared to if it is a situation where it's, a, you know, a medical emergency, you know, having to choose between life or death. Um, and, you know, you know, I'm an advocate against or advocate, advocate, you know, to help women and people who are victims of human trafficking and also other forms of sexual trauma and rape does happen that reduces, you know, that, that results in a pregnancy. I actually have um, a close association with someone who is the product of a rape and her mother did not have an abortion. And so not only does that person affected but also the mother herself had been um, a, a victim of rape and child um, sexual molestation. So from a psychological point of view, when you have a child whose mother or father did not want to have them, whether it was for you know, the horrible way that they were brought into the conception or for any other reason, then there are a lot of psychological damages that result as far as sensing rejection and then that producing subsequent desires to either overachieve or to um, self-sabotage, having low self-esteem, having um, beliefs about yourself that you're not worthy. So then you get into abusive situations. So I think it's important that every child that is here should be loved and wanted. And so, you know, 
I think that's very important. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I, um, mm-hmm. The funny thing that I think is that, uh, not funny, but mm-hmm. ironically, I think that really the people that are probably using it in that way are probably like, so my, this is my imagination perhaps, but I think <laughs> okay. that there are probably a lot of like wealthy people who um, use this as a form of like taking care of, you know, problems that they mm-hmm. have that will continue <laughs> to happen regardless of if it's illegal or not. Right. Um, right so, right. you know, I believe that this has the road decision has always been the floor and not the ceiling because mm-hmm. despite abortion being legal, it still hasn't been fully available to everyone, particularly black, indigenous, people of color, people who That's are right. um, uh, low economic status uh, or living on fixed incomes, people in rural areas, mm-hmm. uh, younger people, particularly like if you think about um, the harder it, it make it for people, um, there could be something happening in a family like incest and, and, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, a young person may not be able to escape that if, if, right. if they don't have access. Um, immigrants, trans people, you know, all of the vulnerable people in our society are the ones who already have difficulty accessing legal abortion. Uh, and here's here's the truth of mm-hmm. the matter. People mm-hmm. with privilege and people with wealth will continue They're going to have say, that's right. access. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this really is a direct attack, I believe, on the most vulnerable of our society. And I don't, mm-hmm. I, I understand what you're saying about it, like you feeling uncomfortable with it being a form of birth control. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that, that, again, it's just so nuanced and so different for every situation that um, I don't even think you can make that sort of, that sort of, uh, uh, that sort of call on it because mm-hmm. who's to say what is birth control or what isn't, right? Like, right, right. Um, what if, what if, you had a one night stand with somebody and then the next day they, you, you end up, you're pregnant and then the next couple of days they punch you. Like, mm-hmm, do mm-hmm. you, are you going to be stuck with this person? You know, I'm saying, I, I'm not saying I'm making that call for that woman, right, in that situation, right. but that's a nuanced situation because in, and if you're saying don't use it as a form of birth control, well, in that case, I guess that person should have this child mm-hmm. with an abusive partner, you know? Right. So. But that I, brings me to, Go ahead. Go ahead. But that, that's my other point. If you're looking at a, a deeper level. So I feel as if, or I conceptualize um, the majority of abortions, even those within marriage are often the result of society making it very appropriate and attractive to have sex outside of marriage. And so if people stop promoting you know, little girls as, you know, prepubescent to even, you know, being sexualized, all the commercials, all the movies, everything being so sexualized and glamorized, then I think if they stop promoting the attractiveness of outside of marriage sex, and they promoted more abstinence rather than sexual promiscuity, then there wouldn't be situations where people are like, oh, I had a one night stand and okay, well, then this happened. Okay, well, I don't want to be stuck with that. So I kind of feel like I, I, I I fundamentally disagree with that. Okay. (laughs) I don't think whatever happens in a bedroom is anybody's business, but the the people Mm -hmm. involved in the bedroom, regardless of a legal, I mean, they're, they're, first of all, marriage has been inequitable in so many forms Mm -hmm. from its inception. Um, So that's one thing. Uh, But Mm -hmm. also I feel like what you're saying is borderline slut shaming. And I don't, I don't think that we should ever do that. Um, well, if you no, I'm not slut shaming, but I feel like I think that society makes it where, like, if you look at just like the demographics and statistics of how much sex is shown on TV, the majority of, I think it was like 82% is between individuals who are not married rather than people who are actually in a marital relationship. So it's just glamorizing the whole time you know, they're making it where that it's, it's desirable and preferable for people to have sex outside of marriage. So I think that if they're going to go as far as, okay, well, we're going to promote you all having sex, but then you can't get pregnant and have a baby and then you can't have an abortion. So if that's the case, then, then stop promoting sex. So that's what I I think it's more of an issue about the male gaze here, because is it really about outside of marriage or is it really about objectifying women because that's where i feel like the problem is because it shouldn't matter if 
I, uh, not if a woman chooses to sleep with a hundred people, that's, that, that doesn't matter. That's, that's, that's her choice to do that. Now, you know, there are consequences that come with that. And those mm-hmm. are, that's, that's something that she has to make a decision about. That's her body. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm not saying me personally, would I do that? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I'm saying that <laughs> once we start going down the slippery slope of what's okay and what isn't. Um, and again, I'm, I'm just, uh, I, yeah, I just feel like the problem really is that we're, t- we're in a society that has all of these expectation on women to solve mm-hmm. the problems of mm-hmm. sexuality and of fertility and of family planning. I saw a sign at the um, a local protest I was at, and it was like, uh, "Don't like abortion? Get it a vasectomy." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. that's where yeah, that's I do agree I'm with at. that. Like, you know, like why is the burden always on women to mm-hmm. not only be um, promiscuous and abstain? Um, and and Dr. Renee, I, that rubs me a little bit wrong because I was raised mm-hmm. in such a um, a strange, um, you know abstinence only kind of Mm -hmm. setting and there's a whole lot of baggage I have with that um but um I mean you know I'm a happily married woman in a in a in a a monogamous relationship and so you know that's that's been my choice but Mm -hmm. um I just fundamentally don't think that that's going to solve any problems by (laughs) by changing this narrative about um sexual health in that way because this is Mm -hmm. to me an issue of healthcare. This is to yeah. be an issue of women accessing what they need medically to exist in the world in a way that's best for them. Mm-hmm. And I do, I, I, I can separate them, but I feel as if the abortion issue is um, secondary or subsequent to the issue of, um, you know, everyone's saying sexual freedom, okay, whatever, you know, that's fine. But I think that there is also a strong role that media, society and culture plays in making sex where it's it's the norm rather than where you should not do it. And therefore, you can help eliminate this problem or the prevalence of it by stopping part of where it starts. Now, I do want to say that even before we had TVs. So when we did our discussion on presidents who have raped one of our one of the products that we gave to each other, me and Dr. Alicia gave to each other was reading or listening to the audible book of Wench. And so that includes in there accounts of women who were enslaved and forced to have relationships, you know, with their slave owners. And so there is an incident where they were giving themselves these different teas to bring about a a self-induced abortion. And so it's not saying that okay, well, if we get rid of all media, this is not going to still happen because people will still find a way to help solve a situation that was being forced upon them, like being raped and having these pregnancies and that's them making you um, then have to see your children then be also raped and sold off for slavery, et cetera. So I'm not saying it in any way does it mean that it's just media that's causing this prevalence of of um, promiscuity and and sexual, you know, control or whatever, and then abortions. But what I am saying is that if in this current day and age that the conversation is now we should control the woman's body, then one, I don't agree with it, but let's also go back to where the actual foundation is. If, if that's going to be the case, then why don't you also fix the problem of not sexualizing everything? And so to me, I feel like they're sending two different messages like, okay, we're going to embrace everyone and all this diversity and everyone can have a choice and freedom, but we're going to punish you if you have the consequences of it. So then stop trying to teach people that it's okay to do one thing mm-hmm. and then punish them at the end. That's but totally just my the, thought. I think the people that are not the people, but the groups mm-hmm. that are behind the abortion bans, which mm-hmm. again, as we see based on polling, is not a huge majority mm-hmm. of our population. I think that they actually do push a lot of these um, ideas of, um, you know, abstinence only and, you know, uh, a Christian based mm-hmm. viewpoint of what mm-hmm. marriage is and what a woman's place is and what, um, 
even inception means because I, I, when I was a teenager, this is, I think, you know, so my, my uh, feelings around abortion Mm -hmm. started when I was younger, like probably 14, 15. And I just started reading. I just started, I was Mm -hmm. like, all I wanted was just to read, 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 read. I still do that now, usually romance novels, but whatever. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But Uh, you know, so one of the books that was really fundamental on me, and I don't even know the name of it, I couldn't even tell you what it was, but it it was the lay the the overview of the history of through the thousands of years that we've documented it of the Mm -hmm. debate on what what when does when does um, uh, conception? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when when Mm -hmm. does life begin? Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely wild, because over the years, the Catholic church, other church groups, other philosophers, the opinion has changed over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm talking about not just like legally, which is what we're getting into now, but um, I'm talking about theologically, you know? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. to me, that means there is no right answer to that question of when. But if you look begin. at it from, from a scientific standpoint, it life begins at conception. So whenever the sperm and the egg meet and they, mm. they are together, you know, that's one living cell connecting with another living cell that produces life. Now there may be the six weeks, you know, time of when it's really touch and go where it may not be viable, but life that's is not six it, weeks. That's 24, 24 weeks to be able right. to live without any kind of, medical support is after 24 weeks, which is why the Roe v. Wade came into being at mm-hmm. that point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I meant like, usually like, you know, how like when you're pregnant and they're like, okay, well, you don't know what's going to happen the first six weeks. You might have like an early miscarriage, that kind of in, you know, in vitro is what I was meaning. Yeah. But my point is like the, the question of like, when does life occur has mm-hmm. been debated for for as long as anybody has been talking about it. So mm-hmm. for a group of politicians to suddenly have figured mm-hmm. out that mm-hmm. problem. Oh yeah. I definitely don't think it's their business because they're not, they're not even scientists. Yeah. They're not <laughs> OBGYNs. They don't have any medical degrees, not even a certificate. So I don't, I, again, although my views are against abortion and although my views are more conservative when it comes to I don't believe in sexism. So I'm not saying everything should be put on the woman, but I think that let's get to the foundational root of it. So if that's the case, if you're going to say that women cannot have abortions and let's also have every male child to have a vasectomy, if that's the case, make it worse, both people, which, you know, they're not going to do. So I don't believe in that in, in, in abortion, but I also don't believe it is the government's right to tell anyone what to do with their body. And when I was thinking about this for our discussion, you know, there are many cultures and religions that have had child sacrifices. And so some have likened, you know, current abortions to be similar to ancient child sacrifices. And someone, okay, well, you are still, you know, killing a child. It's just that the person is actually alive and outside of, you know, the vagina. So what are your thoughts about that? You mean out of the womb? Out of the womb, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm always talking about vaginas and penises up at this podcast. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, out of the womb. Uh, what are my thoughts on that? I mean, I I don't really I I, I would not equate the two. I mean, mm-hmm. um, again, this is happening inside a woman's body. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the abortion rights is is before 24 weeks where mm-hmm. a, a fetus is not viable um you know it's a very personal situation and decision and like i said there mm-hmm. are a bazillion of variables as to mm-hmm. why a woman is in this situation to begin with so to mm-hmm. to like for me uh, it you know it's already a tough decision i'm not saying every yeah. person who gets an abortion struggles through it but I don't think that anybody who seeks abortion takes it Mm -hmm. lightly. Like, it's just sort of like, Oh, I'm going to get my mole removed or something like that. (laughs) Yeah. And, and for that, I mean, not even just because it's a hard decision because family planning is hard, but also because society has put such uh, uh, 
shame on Mm -hmm. women Mm -hmm. for even considering needing an abortion because I mean, even as a mom, I have all the mom guilt for every Mm -hmm. little thing I do Mm -hmm. in my life. Yes. And then to like have to make this decision um, with society telling you you're terrible for making this decision or your religion telling you that, you know, you're being judged for making this decision. Uh, it, it, to me, it's just, again, it just puts the burden on women Mm -hmm. to have to struggle through all of these choices and all these decisions. And now on top of all of the societal shame and burden, we have laws and legislation that are Mm -hmm. forcing a choice on women. Um, So again, I, you know, I don't think that we should even compare what's happening in a woman's body to anything outside of the body um, Mm -hmm. because it's just not the same kind of thing. You know Um, it's a medical situation. So then what about the morning after pill? Do you consider that as a, um, a type of abortion? No, that's a type of contraceptive. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah, that that's preventing anything from even happening. You know, that's just contraceptive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just like IUD. I mean, those are two similar, they act similarly in terms of, of how they work medically. Because I could, you know, for the argument's sake, I could see if, okay, well, you know, something happened and I went out and, you know, I had sex with someone and then now I'm regretting it. So I'm going to go and take this morning after pill. And so which could, you know, if there was something, it can not only prevent anything from happening, but also it can sort of like dissolve everything that has already happened. So to me, I always thought, even and even though yeah. it's marketed, it's marketed as, um, co- you know, a contraceptive, it still is stopping what has already started. So it is more of like an over the counter. I mean, birth of- control does that too. Yeah, <laughs> all the morning after is is like a, a double dose of a heavy dose mm-hmm. birth control. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I mean, this is where we go down the slippery slope because there are groups that believe in IUD is equivalent to an abortion that the morning after yeah, now is that is preventive because that's preventing the the two from ever you know meeting so that's i think you know that is more of a contraceptive part of it well so is the morning that's after all. pill that's why you have to take it within 72 hours but the point is mm-hmm. there are people that mm-hmm. still say oh well you know those two those two things are as equally wrong as having an abortion. So when you start going down the slippery slope of, is it six weeks? Is it 15 weeks? Is it 24 weeks? Is it one day after? Is it three days after? Just stop. This is a woman's body and her Mm -hmm. choice. Mm -hmm. And it's a medical decision. That's it. Like Mm -hmm. that full stop. This is- I mean, yeah, I still think even if, yeah, even if the person is, you know, even if now, you know, there's other situations where men make the women have abortions because they're like, you're going to have this. And, you know, there is already an abusive situation, whether they're married or not, because women in marriage rape does often happen within marital beds. So it's not saying that it's always just the women who are, you know, volunteering to have an abortion. Oftentimes they are forced to. So I think that in that situation, the woman wanted it, but was still forced to. So I would, I would, I would wonder like what the statistic of that is. And I'm not saying Mm -hmm. that women aren't put into that situation, but like, Mm -hmm. obviously that's like a a form of abuse and a form of, it's probably not something that happens um, on a frequent basis, but I'm sure it does happen. But even in that situation, it's like, um, you know, it, it, the issue is not abortion. The issue is again, right? A woman but when I, but my bearing point, the burden, right? But my point is that the woman is still having to exp- have, having to either be forced to have the abortion or now being forced to not have it. So whether it's within the relationship that she's being forced to have the abortion or now governmentally being forced to not have one, it still is a situation of there's a forced pregnancy that or there's a pregnancy that has happened and that people are not recognizing that 
you know, there's a lot of things, like you said, there's a bazillion reasons of why a woman may want to have one or be forced to have one. But from the data that I looked at, the number of persons who come in for abortion services that are from human trafficking, rape, or incest are as small as the ones, the percentage of women who are also coming into abortions that are being forced to from their abusers. But my point was that if a woman is being forced to have an abortion or now being forced to not have one, I think the bigger the, the bigger issues are much greater than just sexual promiscuity. Yeah, I mean, I think the bigger issue here is that let's just be clear women Mm -hmm. are not treated equally in our society very true very true women do not get paid the same Mm -hmm. they do not um experience the same rights as men in our society the equal rights amendment Mm -hmm. has yet to be passed by a Mm -hmm. congress uh and so what i see from this is a continuation of trying to ensure that women are never going to create be created equally in our society Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to me because of the choice uh is being taken away that just further erodes our rights their rights and then the whole issue of our rights to privacy because Mm -hmm. like no one should ever know that that's I true. Yeah, abortion. that's HIPAA provide. Yeah, that's that, uh, that should be the same thing yeah. with protected health information. I agree with that. And I was even but thinking, here we are. Banning go ahead. It, so yeah, like, you no, know, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was even thinking about that um, when I was doing the comparison. So, you know, we have a lot of the assisted suicides. And so there's a whole bunch of legal things and the person, the, the, the doctor is now, you know, they're being acquitted, you're not getting any charge from it. But in that situation, the loss or the end of life is because of the person choosing to end their own life. But that's still their right. So a lot of the arguments now are that it's the woman's body, but it's another person inside of that woman's body. So then the issue when it comes to being allowed to have an abortion or being allowed to have your health information protected, I still think that it still is another person's life that is involved, that is inside. Because I do believe that conception starts as soon as the, the cell and the sperm unite. So, and that's when it usually, you know, that's my, my, what I believe. But I still believe that it's still that person's private information. And that person should still be considerate of the fact that it is another life that she, he, or they as a couple are deciding to end and whether it's because they have been you know sold the lie that sex is okay and you don't have to wait until you're married or they are married and you know there's an abusive situation and they're being you know in a situation where they have an unwanted pregnancy I just still feel like it should not be taken so lightheartedly and but see, I think that that's 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 a myth. Like, I think that that the idea that people are just doing it willy nilly, and mm-hmm. I I mean, there's going to be every type of person doing every type of thing. But like, mm-hmm. it's just again a woman's body, a woman's mm-hmm. choice. Um, mm-hmm. You know, not every person who gets in that situation wants to make that choice, mm-hmm. but has to make that choice for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, the, the, there's, like I said, there's enough shame and guilt in our society around Mm -hmm. women and their choices that they make outside of this one. Mm -hmm. Um, when we start saying like, you're killing a baby, you're killing, and you see these billboards with the, you know, these adorable little infants. Well, let Mm -hmm. me ask you this. If, if this is, if somebody cares about this unborn life so much, why don't we have paid healthcare? Mm-hmm. Why don't we and have maternity. Mm-hmm. maternity, paid maternity or paternity leave? Why don't we mm-hmm. have um, subsidized child care? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why don't we have these fundamental things that would actually make the lives of women and children better mm-hmm. in place? And equal Because pay. It's, not, it's not about what's best for women. This is not, right. that is not the issue. Right. Um, and I agree with that. And that's part of my argument for if, if the, if the, fact of allowing or not allowing an abortion or legalizing or not legalizing it is the real issue. Then let's start with the core issue, which is sexuality. 
And so that's really not the issue. It really is more of a control. And if, like you said, if it were really about, you know, protecting lives, there would be a lot of other social and um, civic fundings and processes and systems in place where, you know, it wouldn't be where this is happening and there would be more viable lives and, and everyone thriving in their communities and their relationships. But because it's not about that, then this is what the cover story is, which is the abortion, which is only affecting the woman. So then that was my part of the argument that, okay, well, if it's really, really, really is about not, you know, you know, not having an abortion and not killing children, then let's also stop what the real, pro- what causes this, which is sex. And then let's stop promoting the sex. But since that's not it, and since you're not going to also <laughs> hold, hold men accountable by making them also have vasectomies, then you can't now say that, okay, well, now we're going to not allow you to have an abortion. So that's not the real reason. But I think the real reason is gender bias and the other systemic and cultural inequities that mm-hmm. are that are oppressing women in general or women specifically. Yes, yes. And like I said earlier, like a lot of the people making these decisions are, are old white men. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And and they they can argue they, and they will argue, you know, uh, the literal holier than thou argument, you know, mm-hmm. which um you can't argue with that honestly. Like it's it's um you know. It, yeah, if you argue with the fool, then you become a fool. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I, there's another one I heard, which is if you wrestle with the pigs, you'll just get muddy. So. Yeah. Yeah. So what should we have for our provoking action? Well, and from my perspective, if you, if you are someone who wants to start getting more active in terms of protecting a woman's right to choose there, I would encourage people to get involved in, um, different organizations and we can list them on our website. Um, I know that Planned Parenthood not only uh, has a lot of work in this area, but they also help to prevent pregnancy in the first place, which I think prevent prevention mm-hmm, mm-hmm, actually mm-hmm. does reduce abortion. Yes. So if you really care yes. about the fact that people are having abortions, then start putting your time behind making sure that pregnancy is prevented in the first place by uh, having free access to birth control and all that stuff. Um, so you can volunteer for those organizations, uh, Planned Parenthood, National Organization for Women, National and Liber- financially Women's support. Lim- yeah. And financially support them, National Women's uh, Liberation Group. So those are just some of the off the top of my head that I'm thinking of. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, you know, as someone who's running for office, mm-hmm. you have to ensure that, pro-choice women are elected across the country and in Mm -hmm. Florida um, or wherever else. Uh, And, you know, to do that, people get behind a candidate. If if this is something you believe in, uh, organize protests, knock on doors, get people registered to vote, Mm -hmm. uh, mobilize people who care about this issue too, to vote in the fall. uh, So we can have our voices be heard. So that's my perspective is to mobilize and act. And Mm -hmm. that's what I've been trying to speak out about, um, this past week. Mm-hmm. And just continuing that, if you do want to support a pro-choice candidate such as Dr. Alicia, where can they donate to your campaign? VoteAlicia.com. VoteAlicia.com. Okay. So in continuing with not only, you know, voting for or helping to elect pro-choice women, I too agree with focusing on prevention and where it may be birth control, but I think on a deeper level, it should also be stopping with the demand for pro-sexual and pro-sexualized activities, media, and definitely stopping with the sexualizing of women, girls, children, and boys. I think if you stop with that, then that could also help significantly. There was a a school in New York that was even teaching about masturbation to the kids who were in kindergarten. So I just stop with all this early sexualization of children and early exposure and then continued exposure through media and through entertainment. So helping to vote against those type of industries and also anything that's involving sex, if you help reduce the demand, such as human trafficking, such as pornography and all of the sexual activities that can also help stop with the 
desire a person to then try to react or act out those situations where they are causing women to then be forced to have sex and then having to have a forced pregnancy and then having to be forced to either have an abortion or to carry the child to full term. So I'm more of a at the core type of provoking action. So get behind and um, get behind and get against the entertainment industries and the curriculums that are supporting the sexualizing of not only women, girls, and boys, but also to just stop entertaining so much of the, um, it's okay and it's really cool to have a, have a whole bunch of <laughs> promiscuous sex. That would just be my one thing. And obviously, again, it's still a person's right. It's still a woman's right in her body. So it's focusing on what can you do to help ensure that there is true equality and freedom for every person when it comes to their medical and health information. And I'll say again to, you know, just as a last thought that, you know, mm -hmm. every pregnancy is different. Every right. individual pregnancy has to be evaluated to give the right care to an individual. Mm -hmm. um, there are some pregnancies that are never viable. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some uh, decisions that are super personal that we will never know why uh, somebody is making a decision. And that is again, between a woman, her healthcare provider, and it should not have any political interference. Mm -hmm. <sighs> okay, well, um, heavy topic, but Mm -hmm. discuss. Yeah, and I'm glad we're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> Next week we're going to be talking about something I think a little bit more lighthearted. Yes. Right? Um, yes, we're focusing on the power and psychology of positive thinking and how it actually is scientifically proven to improve your quality of life. That's a long title, but we'll work on <laughs> we'll work on whittling it down. Yes, so we'll see you on the next time. We are your provocateurs. I'm Dr. Renee. And I'm Dr. Alicia. Be informed, be entertained, be provoked. I don't know what to say next. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, then it could just go into the... Yeah, this is, you know, provocative conversation. They can go into that. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little...